قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأصدق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال نوح ربي إنهم عصوني واتبعوني من لم يزده ماله وولده إلا خسارا ومكروا مكرا كبارا وقالوا لا تذرنا آلحتكم ولا تذرنا ودا ولا سواء ولا يغوثا ويؤقا ونصرا وقد عضلوا كثيرا ولا تزد الظالمين إلا ضلالا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى على محمد وعلى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down 124,000 prophets to humanity for one purpose only. And that is the purpose of guidance. The responsibility of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to guide their communities, to guide humanity, to getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Guidance itself comes in many different variations and many different forms. We see that today, though we are absent from the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have at our disposal the legacy of the prophets of Allah. We have the whole Qur'an. We have the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt salam. We have the narrations and the words of the Imams of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. We have scholars who are the interpreters of these words. We come forth and we see that during that time when these prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are living amongst their community, they attempt to guide them on several different dimensions. The first dimension or the first means by which the prophets guided their community was by allowing them to be a reminder for those individuals. In the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes reference to the prophets of Allah, makes reference to the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being known as Ahlul Dhikr, the people of remembrance. Their responsibility is to remind the people in the community about the bounties of God, for instance. As we mentioned yesterday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down the prophets. The prophets, they tell the people, look at the sun and look at the moon and look at the stars. These are all the signs of God. Remind, remember God, remember that there is a creator who has demonstrated his authority over all of this by means of these creation. A second dimension is when the prophets come forth and they say, okay, now that you've understood and now that we've reminded you to reflect on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now you need to go and apply that knowledge that you have. Now that you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the heavens and the earth and the sun and the stars and the moons and the ocean, now submit toward that God. Submit toward that Lord because that is the difference between Iman and Islam. The first step, the religion of Islam, means the religion of submission. Anyone can submit by stating La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah but true testimony in terms of belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that which is with the heart and that is what is known as Iman. On one level, so ever, anyone who states the shahadatain is a Muslim but to get to the higher level they need to practice that belief. They need to have that knowledge with the heart. The, nar the narration from Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahj al balagh it states Al-Iman ma'rifata بالقلب والإكرار باللسان والأمل بالأركان Three ways. The first step is to have faith in your heart. Then you need to perform the testimony with the tongue. And you need to act upon it. You need to pray. You need to fast. You need to follow suit of the legislation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared for us. So on one level is Islam. Another level is Iman. The prophets, alayhim afdalu salati wa salam, they come toward their communities. And the first step is that they remind them. And then the second step is for them to advise them in terms of how to actually practice their faith. But that's not sufficient. We need to always be pushing the envelope. We need to always be doing our best to internalize those acts of worship and allow our hearts and our souls to ascend to an even higher level. Which is why we come forth and we see that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of their responsibilities is to, in the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen, to awaken the dead intellects of their communities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we mentioned last night, 
gives every single member of humanity what is known as the fitrah. The fitrah is the innate nature which allows us to believe in God, which allows us to be receptive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what happens over time is that community, society, our family, it penetrates that light and it begins to dim that light. It begins to darken that light where we're unable to be receptive toward the divine commandments. The responsibility of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to wake them up. And, and the way that they do that is they begin to present a worldview toward their community. How do they do that? They begin to force that mind. They begin to force that intellect to think a little bit. How many of us, for instance, have been woken up in the middle of the night asking ourselves these questions. Why did God create me? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Asking these type of questions or the fact that these questions, we pose ourselves these same queries is part of the divine light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with. The important thing is that when these questions are posed toward us, we act upon them and then we begin to seek answers. But the majority of people, when these questions are posed toward them, they ignore them and they move on with their lives. The prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they plant these questions toward their community and it's the responsibility of the community to go back and recognize that this prophet, this God-given representative, he is the one who has those answers. And now I need to come forth and seek from him. I need to go and seek through him. When these questions are posed, why did God create me? Where do we go? Who do we ask? Or do, we ask my, do I ask my mom? Do I ask my dad? Who do I ask these questions? Do I ask Sheikh? Do I ask my teachers? No. You need to go toward the Creator and ask him, Oh Creator, why did you create me? Oh Allah, why did you create me? And then we come and we find the answer within the whole of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, We did not create man, we did not create jinn, except that they worship me. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us so that we're obedient to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us so we can worship him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to test us to determine who is going to be the most submissive toward him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down 124,000 prophets. He sends divine representatives by means of successors to these prophets. He sends down the 12 imams of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. He sends down his holy book and he's trying to determine who is going to be most submissive toward these creations the creations who God has ordered us to follow. But as we know, it is the nature of man, the nature of humanity, to reject these individuals, unfortunately. Except for the few. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, in the earlier generations, nothing changed. In the earlier generations, only a few people believed. And in the, la and in the latter days, the end of times, only a few people will believe. But those who believe, they have allowed their hearts to be receptive to that light where they're able to ascend the heavens and attain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the first step is to submit. The first step is to realize. The first step is to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not sent all of this in vain, but there's a purpose behind all of that. When we return back to chapter 71 of the whole of Quran, Surah Nuh, we see that Prophet Nuh salam, is complaining toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what he has been preaching toward his community. And we go and we see that he's at the end of these complaints. He's at the end of his patience. And he realizes that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one to listen to his plea, is the one to listen to his dua. We continue with our commentary with verse number 21 after Prophet Nuh alayhi salam explains toward his community he's telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I told them about the sun and I told them about the moon and I told them about the trees and the earth and the oceans and all of these blessings and all of these bounties that you have given them but they did not listen to anything that I said in verse number 21 Prophet Nuh alayhi salam he states Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states qala Nuh Nuh said Rabbi innahum asawni wa attaba'u man lam yazidhu maluhu wa waladuh illa khasara Nu complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He called out, he said, Oh my Lord, surely they have disobeyed me. Innahum qala nuhun rabbi innahum asawni. They have disobeyed me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we mentioned, sends down these divine representatives who their obedience is a wajib for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. 
He sends the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, We have to obey them in every single phase and every single fast. But most people, though they know that these individuals are unique, they present doubts in their mind and veils over their hearts so that they end up rejecting these holy personalities. They did it during the time of the Prophet They did it during the time of Nuh. They did it during the time of Ibrahim and Musa and Isa. They did it during the time of all of the Prophets of God. Most of them, they disobeyed the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends dozens of Prophets of Bani Israel, dozens of Prophets to the children of Israel. What happens? Dozens of these Prophets, they were killed by their communities. They were killed by their communities. The only thing that they were doing was preaching the message of God, telling them to believe in one God, telling them to act morally and ethically with those around. Them. What happened? They were killed. Their blood was shed based on their advices and based on their leadership skills in terms of trying to bring them closer from darkness, out of darkness, into light. Oh my Lord, surely they have disobeyed me. We see that when we want to take example from this particular line, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt And if the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they come forth and they present us a particular concept, it is our responsibility to submit toward them entirely, wholly. For instance, we come and we see that many people on the day of Ashura, the majority of the people are on the opposing side of Imam Hussein Upwards of 30,000 people ready to shed the blood of Imam Hussein. They knew that he was the grandson of the Prophet They know that. They know he's Sayyid Shabab Ahl al-Jannah. They know he's the leader of the youth of paradise. But why do they want to shed his blood? Because they don't want responsibility as we mentioned yesterday. Imam al-Hussein told them that when you listen to me, you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to do this. They don't want to listen to that. They don't want to have anything to do with responsibility. Omar ibn Sa'ad, the commander of the army on the day of Ashura, the commander of the army on the day of Ashura is standing in front of Imam al-Hussein and he knows Imam al-Hussein from when Imam al-Hussein is a child. He knows that Hussein is Hussein. He knows that this is the son of Ali and Fatima. In fact, on the 2nd of Muharram, when the caravan of Imam al-Husayn salam, it reaches Karbala, and Umar ibn Sa'ad, he himself and his contingency of the army also reaches, he receives that letter from Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He receives a letter from Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa, telling him that you must present Imam al-Husayn salam toward me in order that he presents, the, you know, in order that he gives the allegiance to myself and then to Yazid, or you bring me his head. At this moment, if you go ahead and read the books of history, you will see that Umar ibn Sa'd, he begins to recite poetry to himself, saying, I know that if I submit to Hussein, he will take me to the gardens of paradise. But if I kill Hussein, then I will be able to take the government post of Ray, present day Tehran. This was his um, gift if he had shed the blood of Imam Hussein Alayhi he knows that to get to paradise, he has to submit to Imam Hussein salam, but he doesn't care about tomorrow, as he mentioned yesterday. He's in it for the now. He says, I will be able to attain this blessing and that blessing. That's more apparent for me than attaining reward tomorrow, so I'll go for this. <laughs> Prophet Nuh is saying, I've told them everything. I've told them that in this life, that I will allow for the heavens to open up and rain will fall down from the sky and wealth will be in their pockets in ways that they couldn't have imagined. As you mentioned a couple of nights ago, they will be able to have children. They will be able to have you know, their communities and their civilization grow. They'll be able to prosper. But they don't want to know what's going to happen tomorrow after they submit. The only thing that they're in it is for the now. And they don't want responsibility. We have to know and we have to recognize that we potentially are going to have that same opportunity, whether to submit toward the Imam of Ahlul Bayt or to not. We have to go ahead and take a look and have true knowledge of who that personality is. The narration from the Holy Prophet states, Men mata wa huwa lam ya'rif Imam zamanihi ma tamitatin jahiliyyah. The one who does not have ma'rafa, the one who does not have this deep knowledge of the Imam of his time, he dies the death of those in jahiliyyah. These people, they didn't know the Imam of their time. They didn't know Nuh. Those, didn't, those on the day of Ashura, they didn't know who was Hussein. Do we know who was the Mahdi? Do we know who was the Imam of our time? Do we read about him? Do we learn about him? Do we make dua for him? Do we pray for him? What do we do for him? In order that we build that link with the Imam of our time. It is said that during this time in the dark period of Islamic history, after the passing of the Holy Prophet after the day of Ashura, people had no idea what to believe in. 
They didn't know where to go. They didn't know what was their outlet. They didn't know who was the one who was going to take them toward Paris. Because they certainly didn't want to go to the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt because siding with the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, as he mentioned, means responsibility. So it is said that one day a man, at the end of his life, he's of old age, he begins and he is reading the books of hadith maybe and he remembers that narration perhaps he was there when that prophet sallallahu stated that the one who does not know the imam of his time he dies the death of those in jahili so he didn't know where to go but the leader of that time the leader of that particular region was a man by the name of hajjaj ibn yusuf al thaqafi hajjaj ibn yusuf al thaqafi is one of the governors of banu umayyah who was known to eat the blood of, of the shia of ahl al-bayt in every single meal he would kill a shia take the blood mix it in his food and eat it he was this type of cruel disgusting despicable leader hajjaj ibn yusuf al thaqafi is responsible for killing tens of thousands of followers of ahl al-bayt tens of thousands can you imagine there are so many anecdotes that speak about the crimes of hajjaj ibn yusuf al thaqafi it's unbelievable it is said that this man, he goes to Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi and he says, Oh Hajjaj, I know that the Prophet, you know, he appointed Ali ibn Abi Talib as a successor, but I didn't do the bay'atim, I didn't give him my allegiance. I don't want to deal with that. And then Ashura came, I left Hussein because I don't want to fight, I don't want to go, I don't want to die. Hajjaj, you are the leader of the time, and I want to make sure that I fulfill the responsibility that the Prophet stated in this narration, the one who does not know the imam of his time dies the death of those in Jahiliyyah. So, oh, Hajjaj, you are my imam. You know what Hajjaj tells him? He says, you know what? You're not worth it for me. I'm not going to give you my hand so that you shake it and give, you know, give my hand the allegiance. So he took out his foot and he says, kiss my foot, and that's how you're going to give the allegiance to me. What did this man do? He kisses the feet of Hajjaj. What I'm trying to say is what? That if you don't fall into the line of truthhood, you will fall into falsehood. If you didn't side with Muslim bin Aqil on that day when he comes toward Kufa, you'll, file, you'll, you'll fall on the side of Abdullah bin Ziyad and Yazid. Be careful. Because truth and falsehood, it looks very, very similar. But we have to make sure that every single step that we take is the step of caution, precaution. Make sure that we're directing our hearts toward that which is virtuous, that which is morality. Whenever someone tells you, for instance, that this is the easy route to paradise, there's no easy way to paradise. It doesn't work like that, right? You have to go, you have to make an effort, you have to go through the trials and tribulations of life, and that's how you attain success at the end. Because it's very easy to be of the majority. It's very easy to be of the 800,000 people who rejected Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. But only those dozens who followed him, they are the ones who are remembered for eternity. We go back toward the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, قَالَ نُوْهٌ رَبِّي إِنَّهُمْ أَسَوْنِي Nuh is complaining to Allah, oh, oh my Lord, Surely they have disobeyed me. And they began to believe those, or they began to follow those who are not going to increase in their wealth or in their children. The only thing that's going to increase if they follow those individuals is loss in this life and in the, life, and in the next. What happened? The community, they began to slowly neglect Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam the more the more that he preached, the more that they began to leave him. The more that he preached, the more that they began to throw insults at him, as he mentioned a couple of nights ago. What happens is this, that Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, he preaches this and he preaches that toward the community. The leaders, the heads of the community, they begin to gather, the tribes, the heads of the tribe, they begin to gather in the middle of the night, in several different days, over several months, over several years. They begin to wonder what exactly are we going to do in order to boycott Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. What happens? Oftentimes, the leaders in the community, number one, are the wealthy, they're the ones who have power, and so on and so forth. Similarly, in this particular story of Nuh alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the people of that community, the people in that society who neglected Prophet Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam's message, they were the wealthy and they were the powerful because they're the ones with influence naturally in community. But why did people fail to submit toward Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam? And people, naturally they incline toward those who are wealthy and those who are powerful. Humanity, we have something perhaps very wrong with us in the way that we are leading our lives. And that is that, def that our definition of success is far different from the success that is presented within the whole Qur'an, within the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa What do we mean? That if today we went and we took all of us on a bus trip, and we began to drive through New York City, for instance. We're driving through New York City on this night, Sunday evening, for instance. And we're driving through Fifth Avenue. 
You see these beautiful apartments, beautiful homes, wealthy people going out, walking around in big shopping bags. Naturally, if we were to pose the question, are these people successful? No one would have any problem stating that they're not successful. And many of them, they may be successful. Because our success is determined on what? On the way that they live, on the cars that they drive, on the houses that they're living in, on mansions and on what type of restaurants that they're eating at, and so on and so forth. But if we were driving continuously across New York City on this bus, and night began to set, and it became dark outside, and then we saw a couple of homeless people living on the street, and we would pose the same question. Are these people successful? Again, most people, they would not hesitate to state, no, they're not successful. They didn't study hard when they were in school. They didn't work hard, which is why they're living on the street. We jump to conclusions in assuming why those individuals are not successful and why those individuals who are wealthy are very successful. When we go toward the Qur'an, or before we, get to, before we go to the Qur'an, let's say we continue this drive. We begin to drive toward Long Island. And we see an individual living in a massive mansion. He has Porsches in his driveway. He has a massive swimming pool, Olympic-sized swimming pool in his backyard. Right? He's coming out with his family. They're getting into this car. They're getting into that car. Whatever the situation. Right? Quickly, we jump to the conclusion and state, this man, he is the definition of success. We want to be like him. When we go toward the Qur'an, we see there was one man who lived in a really, really big mansion. This man, he was a leader of a large portion of the world probably during that day. He had authority. People used to call him God. They used to worship him. Is that successful? Fir'aun. Fir'aun la'natullah alayh. Fir'aun is the biggest villain within the whole of Qur'an. Physically, materialistically, he was very successful. He lived it up. He lived a good life. On the flip side, Musa alayhi salam, in the same story of Fir'aun, he was an adopted child of Pharaoh, neglected, forgotten about, right? He was poor later on in his life, right? He had to go to work for Shaib, his father-in-law. All of these things, people wouldn't say that this guy is very successful, right? Furthermore, we go ahead and we take a look and we see, for instance, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein, 70 people against 30,000. But if we just remove the names out of it, all of a sudden, we begin to state that, you know, those guys who are on the side of 30,000, they're probably a lot more successful than the guy with 70, right? Because our definition of success is far different from reality. Success in the Islamic context, the success in the religious context is closeness toward God. When we're going through difficulties in our life, we can't say, oh, this is because of all my sins and so on and so forth. No, because difficulties in life are part of the nature of the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world and created this universe. That's just the way that things are. The more difficulties that one goes through, that doesn't mean that you're less successful. What's, what matters is how close you are between your heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But naturally we see that people are always inclined toward following those who are more wealthy, those who are more powerful. We love to read gossip. We love to read the tabloids. We want to know about the lives of all of the celebrities and about all of the athletes because that's what we want to be. We mirror ourselves to be like those individuals. Maybe we're like, no, we don't really like those people. We just want to be entertained. No, but it's probably something deep down in our heart because of the culture that we live in is inclined toward learning about those people as opposed to individuals who are truly successful. We go back toward the verse, Allah subhanahu wa is complaining to Nuh about the same exact problem. Oh, oh my Lord, they have disobeyed me. They began to follow those individuals who have the wealth and, to have the chil- and who have the children, but in reality, they're not going to benefit from that. The only thing they're going to benefit is in terms of more loss, in terms of falling further away from you. Oh my Lord. Verse number 21. Verse number 22, Allah states, And they began to plan this great plot. What was that plot? The people during the time of Nuh as we mentioned, the leaders of the tribe, they began to gather together. What exactly was the plot that they began to think about in terms of conspiring against Nuh? The Mufassirin of the Qur'an, they don't really speak about that because we don't necessarily have details in the narrations of Ahlul Bayt But we can perhaps speculate. And we see that during the time of Prophet Lut the community of Lut, they wanted to repel the Prophet of Allah and they stated that we want to purify our community. They wanted to purify their community from the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the time of Nabi Saleh, the community, they began to plot and try to kill Saleh alayhi salam in the middle of the night while he was sleeping in his bed with his family. So that he was unable to defend himself. 
there were plenty of plots to kill the Holy Prophet If you go ahead and read what the prominent individuals in the Arabian Peninsula during the time of the Prophet did, you would realize that people, they tried to kill the Prophet They tried to do so to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt They began to plot, they began to plan, they began to make their very best efforts to neglect the Prophet even further than he was already neglected. They began to push him and marginalize him even further than he was already marginalized. Rejecting the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with one heart veiling themselves from that divine light. And when in one individual who is popular, who is respected within the community, calls everyone else to gather together and reject this individual, naturally people are going to jump onto the bandwagon and state, look, if everyone else is doing it, then let me do it too. On the day of Ashura, we go and we see that everyone put off their responsibility after killing Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wa when they returned back toward Kufa, people, they went toward, for instance, Umar ibn Sa'd. Umar ibn Sa'd is the leader of the army. Yes, he's the leader of the army. They went toward Umar ibn Sa'd and they said, Oh, Umar ibn Sa'd, why did you kill Imam al Hussein? He said, I didn't kill him. Shimr did it. They went toward Shimr. They said, Shimr, why did you kill Imam al Hussein? He said, Umar ibn Sa'd told me to. They went back toward Umar ibn Sa'd. They said, Shimr said that you said, told him to do it. He said, Well, I was just acting on the instruction of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa. Right? They went toward Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. They saw Ibn Ziyad. Why did you kill Imam al-Hussein? He said, I was just following the instruction of Yazid. We want to put off the responsibility. Everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon when it comes to doing something bad. But in reality, they're all partners in this crime. It, said, it is said that one day during the... Um, salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. During the Khalafah of Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wa salam, there was a incident which took place, a crime that took place where an individual had been killed or an individual had been robbed. It is said that, th- that there were three, four criminals brought to the court of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, which one of you committed the crime? Which one of you committed the crime? They all, none of them spoke. He said, look, you were all, you know, there were witnesses, eyewitnesses to state that you guys are the ones who took this, you know, who carried out this crime. Which one of you guys did it? They all said, we didn't do it. We didn't do anything. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he got them one by one. He said, what did you do? He said, well, I'm just the one who brought the rope. Another one said, I'm the one who brought the knife. Another one said, I'm the one who tied it. Another one says, I'm the one who pulled it out of his pocket. Right? Well, you're all responsible for committing the crime, right? But none of them wanted to admit toward it because they said, we just did something small. وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا كبارا. They began to conspire one by one. And in reality, it was the entire community who naturally is responsible for committing such a crime by neglecting and marginalizing the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا كُبَّارًا وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِحَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاءً وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَأُوقَ وَنَصْرَ they began to plot against the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they began to say amongst themselves, O oh people, don't leave behind your gods. Don't leave behind your gods. Keep on worshipping these guys. Keep on worshipping these idols. Nuh alayhi salam is trying to preach Tawheed and we're trying to preach polytheism. This will be the way to get to the heart of Nuh. And then these individuals, the leaders of the tribe, they go and they begin to quote the names of their gods. لا ولا تبرنا وودا سواء يغوتا يأوقا نصرا. These are all five names of gods that this community used to worship. The question: How did a community that was only ten generations between Prophet Adam and Nuh alayhi salam begin to begin such idol worship? We come and we see what happened was that these five names that are presented by the leader of the tribe during the time of Nuh salam, were individuals in the community who were highly respected. They were the wealthy. Maybe not they were the wealthy, but they were the respected. They were the honored. They were, you know, the um, heads of tribes. They were grandfathers of maybe the biggest families in the community and so on and so forth. Everyone used to go to them with their problems and so on. And slowly, slowly, these individuals, they began to draw pictures after they passed away. And they began to put them in their homes. Eventually, that pictures became idols. Eventually, that reverence that they had, that respect that they had for these family members, as the time went on and decades and centuries passed by, no longer were they just respecting their family by praying for them and so on and so forth, but they began to worship their embodiments and their illustrations and their idols. Right? So Prophet Nuh is coming toward these people, 
trying to preach Tawheed, quickly they begin to plot and say that the, the thing that hurts the prophets most, the thing that hurts the divine representatives most, is when you start doing the wrong things in basic acts of worship. What lesson can we take from this? That yes, we are not polytheists. We don't worship idols, that's true. But we need to make sure that we're not worshiping the idols of the heart. We need to make sure that we are making our very best effort to cleanse our hearts from any sort of shirk that we have in worship. When we're praying, how many of us are concentrating on our salat? How many of us are focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the midst of our prayers? Very few of us, including myself. I'm thinking about everything else except for prayers, right? I'm thinking about everything else except for the time, for, for the actual moment when I'm building this link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm thinking about iftar, thinking about who's calling me, who just texted me, you know, who's praying next to me, who is behind me, right? You're thinking about everything else. In fact, some people, they state that whenever we lose something, whenever we lose something in the house, you know, and we don't know where it is, might as well pray Turaqat prayers. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send you a revelation after, but because you're going to remember in the midst of your prayers. You remember everything that's not important in the midst of praying salat, right? We need to make sure that we make our strongest effort to build that sincerity in terms of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our acts of worship. Otherwise, in reality, yes, we're not worshiping another Lord, we're not worshiping another God, but at the same time, we have this tendency where we're thinking about everything other than God, and that is the same thing, at the, in, in the very least, as some variation of shirk, some variation of politics. So they come, and they gather amongst themselves, and they begin to make this plot in order perhaps to kill Prophet Nuh salam, or to marginalize Prophet Nuh salam, or so on and so forth. But Prophet Nuh, he remains committed toward preaching the message. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah Rasulullah Verse number 24, chapter 71 of the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quoting Nuh alayhi salam again. وَقَدْ أَبَلُّوا كَثِيرًا وَلَا تَزَدَ الظَّالِمِينَ Illa Surely that this community, Prophet Nuh salam, states, is only going more, entering more into darkness. What happens? In the middle of this desert, right? We said that Prophet Nuh salam, is, preaching, is preaching the message in contemporary Kufa. Prophet Nuh salam, in the middle of the desert begins to start building this ark. He's building an ark in the middle of the desert. If you saw a man building an ark in the middle of a desert, what would you think? This man is crazy, yeah? It only supported their argument more when Nuh salam, begins to build this ark. But for those people who knew the commitment, who knew the devotion, who knew the sincerity of Nuh salam, they're ready to submit to it. Those very few, that handful of people. Prophet Nuh salam, begins to build this ark. He's preparing, he's advising people, come and join me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring down a flood from the sky. He's going to bring down rain from the sky. He's going to flood our, our region. And all of you are going to drown. They're saying, oh Nuh, we are not even close to the water. What are you talking about? Right? So they begin to increase in their animosity toward Nuh. And they begin to increase in their mocking and their joking and their marginalization of the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, Prophet Nuh salam, remains in his commitment. And at this time, this is the moment now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, probably he begins to tell Nuh, oh Nuh, don't worry about them anymore. You have done your responsibility. You have preached your message. Let it go. You see, my brothers and sisters, there comes a time, and let me go, go ahead back and read this verse of the whole Quran. وَقَدْ أَبَلُّوا كَثِيرًا وَلَا تَزَدُ الظَّالَمِينَ إِلَّا ضَلَالًا When someone is constantly transgressing the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is God Himself who says, you know what? There's no more room for this individual. Let us allow him to enter into complete and utter darkness. It comes to that stage sometimes. We see, for instance, Fir'aun, as we mentioned before. Fir'aun, this great villain mentioned in the whole of Quran, is an individual who, tell, who tells the people, Ana Rabbukum wal A'la. He says, I am your Lord, worship me. This is the level that, that, that Fir'aun had reached, right? Prophet, but, but, but Prophet Musa salam, would pray to Allah says, oh, oh Allah, remove Fir'aun. But what happens? Allah says, I will remove him in my own way. What does he do? He begins to keep on blessing Fir'aun. He begins to give Fir'aun more wealth. He begins to give Fir'aun more children. He begins to give Fir'aun more authority, more followers. He feels so good about himself, Fir'aun, that he forgets completely about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens? In our life, we go through difficulty. Our life, we go through stints of poverty. We go through sickness. 
We go through illness. We go through deaths in our family. Every single time that we go through such difficulties, such problems, we turn back toward Allah. Allah help me, remove me from this problem, remove me from poverty, from sickness, so on and so forth. Yes? But when someone is not receiving any sort of trials and tribulations, this is another way that Allah tries them. He says, you know what? I'm not going to give them any problems because so that he will never even forget to return back toward me. Hadith, it says, that if you see yourself without any sort of illness or without poverty in your life, as in a long stretch of your life, then beware. Another hadith that states that if you do not go through 40 days without a trial or without a tribulation, if you do not go 40 days without a trial or tribulation, then know that something is wrong in your iman, something is wrong in your faith. You're not doing something right if everything is going well in your life. A hadith from Imam al-Baqir, alayhi salatu wa salam, He states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives trials and tribulations toward His choicest, His most beloved believers, His most beloved servants in the same way that a father chooses to give gifts to his daughter. And the words of the Imam are very unique. How come he doesn't say the same way that a father likes to give gifts to his son? Because perhaps there's a different type of relationship, right? Between the father and the daughter. In the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves to give trials and tribulations toward those whom he loves. He knows their limits. In the same way that we might know our limits of our children, we can't give them too much because then they're going to become disobedient. In the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep on drowning them with difficulties and problems, but he'll know when is their cracking point. Right? Instead of complaining about our problems and our difficulties, we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us patience in the midst of those problems. That is the difference between someone who is able to hold back and remain patient and build that link with God by means of those difficulties and those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give them any problems. The smallest problem in their life, they break their nail and that's at yawm al-qiyamah. You never hear the end of it, right? There's this, type of, uh, there, there, there's this type of group of people on one side of the spectrum and then there is the other side. Going back toward the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states, وَقَدْ أَبَلُّ كَثِيرًا they were constantly transgressing the boundaries of God. They did not, have, they did not want, want to have anything to do with the Messenger of God. They hated Nuh salam. They had this type of animosity. 950 years of abusing him, generation after generation, training their kids to hate the Messenger of God. Right? And for that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow for them to completely live a life in absolute darkness. For their oppression toward the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increased their darkness, increased their misguidance, so there's no way turning back. We need to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He constantly allows us to be a recipient of His mercy so that we do not fall into the stage where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes all of his bounties and blessings from us due to our transgression. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq, to continue in our commentary, in our reflections from the ayat, from the verses of the Holy Quran. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallillahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin wa rahimallah man qara'a surat al-mubarakatil.